Welcome to episode 15 of the Self Care 101 podcast with your host, Pooja K. McClymont, talking all things well being, how to get unstuck, build more confidence, and feel more fulfilled. Thank you so much for listening today. On this episode, I have the privilege of interviewing my longtime friend, Kelly, who has quite an emotional journey to share with you about wanting a baby and living with PCOS. A lot of people want to have a baby. And for some, it's super easy. They have sex and then, ta-da, they've got a bun in the oven. However, for almost one in seven heterosexual couples in the UK, this is simply not the case. Reasons for not being able to conceive easily, they vary, couple to couple. And PCOS, which is polycystic ovary syndrome, it's a common condition that affects how women's ovaries work, but there's no treatment for it. It's been rearing its head for a long while now, yet still doesn't have the awareness that it should. It's a silent reason for difficulties getting pregnant, but one that we should all know more about. Weight plays a big role with PCOS, and in general, all pregnancies, but Kelly's struggle meant that she had to take drastic action about her weight because of her age as well, in order to help her chances of conceiving. This is an emotional story and one that I feel honoured to have been able to learn about. I'm so grateful to Kelly for allowing me to interview her for the podcast in the hope that her insights might be able to help someone. So let's get to it. Thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. I know it's a very personal thing to talk about, but I've got so many people that I work with who are going through fertility challenges and I'm sure there's many others who are listening today and I think that your journey is quite special it's quite unique and there's been so many ups and downs and around and around that I think it's really useful for people to know how to manage it all without Mm. losing hope and obviously you know mental health challenges I'm that's a big thing that I talk about in my practice and in the podcast so I thought that having you on the show and people hearing firsthand, you know, all the things that you've been through, which have been a lot, but you know, you, I mean, I see you often and you just, you're managing, which Mm -hmm. I know we all can put on a front, especially when we're feeling a bit down about life, but you know, you've, you're still going to work. You're still optimistic. And I find that really admirable. So I am very grateful for you doing this podcast for me (laughs) today it's my pleasure because I know it is something that a lot of people are going through yeah so I mean I've just introduced you and a little bit about your journey and obviously how we know each other so maybe in your own words if you could share sort of I guess where the PCOS journey started for you like you know when you found out about diagnosis or Mm -hmm. even just before maybe when you were like struggling with your weight that might might be a good starting point. Yeah, it actually started off with me just having really bad periods when mm-hmm. I was in my teens. Um, probably towards the end of my teens, I had a lot of pain. Um, sometimes I wouldn't be able to get up and go to college um, or like sometimes I'd have like my Saturday job and I wouldn't be able to go because I was in so much pain. So I went to the doctor, they did a couple of tests and they came back and they're like, oh, we think you've got... They actually diagnosed me with endometriosis, first of all. Mm-hmm. Um, then after doing some more tests they said I had PCOS but what I found and even now is that they don't really know anything about it they tell you you've got it they tell you to eat less move more and that's about it if you want any more information it's not going to happen you have to go and look into that yourself so um I noticed that it first of all started off with the heavy periods and then all of a sudden I started to gain weight I was always kind of on the chubby side but towards the end of my teens into my 20s I just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger didn't know why I wasn't doing anything different to everyone else Mm -hmm. um but then when I went back they said well you know with PCOS you can put on weight but they never really told me why it's not only it's until probably I'd say 28 when I decided to do something about my weight which is when I decided to do a lighter life and lose some weight but I actually started to look into PCOS more and do more research myself because I wasn't getting any help yeah the doctors and I found out that I had insulin resistance which is a bit like being pre-diabetic which kind of was like okay that's why I'm putting on weight. Was that because of weight gain because or was that after you did lighter life? It was after I did lighter life I was looking at ways to keep the weight off okay and that's when I started to look into okay what is it that is going on with me Mm. and so I had an inkling that I had 
um, insulin resistance. But going to the doctors again, no help. They didn't do any tests or anything. But in my mind, I was like, okay, I'm doing this research. You guys don't seem to know anything. So I'm going to diagnose myself. Right. And I'm going to say I've got insulin resistance, which is very prominent to people with PCOS, women with PCOS. You can have it without having that. Mm-hmm. But women with PCOS who are overweight, that's the reason why, because they've got insulin resistance. They just don't know it because doctors don't tell you. So where are you getting your information from? If Online. Not, really? And a lot of America, a lot of information I got from American doctors, people that have PCOS but know a lot about it because they've done their own research. But I just had to go online and look and find all the information out for myself. Okay. Right. So now with the insulin resistance, how did that work with your PCOS? Did it help with the weight managing? Well, it's funny because I knew I had it. So for a point of time, it was like, well, that's why I'm overweight because I've got insulin resistance. Didn't do anything about it. It was just the knowledge of, okay, I've got insulin resistance. That's why I'm overweight. It's not my fault. Let's just live life. Okay. I didn't eat crazily, Mm -hmm. but, you know, I knew there was a reason why I was overweight and it wasn't my fault. So I kind of just still tried to eat healthy, you know, brown rice, brown pasta, all of that kind of stuff. Um, But it gave me a reason and I didn't feel like I was doing something wrong. So I knew I had insulin resistance. Well, so I thought I knew I had insulin resistance. It wasn't my fault. I've got PCOS. This is just one of the symptoms. So you just have to deal with it. You're going to be overweight. That's it. Right. So what did you do? Just tried to eat healthy and exercise and just do what I can. But as I say, because I didn't I didn't know a lot about insulin resistance at the time, I thought it was just something that I just had to live with. Right. I didn't know that by eating the right food and actually really understanding how insulin resistance works and how you I don't think you can ever get rid of it, but you can minimize the symptoms of insulin resistance. But I didn't know you could do that with food. I just thought it's something that you have and you just live with it and you kind of just get on with life. Okay. And then, so then you sort of, at this point, um, where, what, how old are we? Probably say about 30, 31 okay. at this point. So I'd done like a life, lost loads of weight, yeah. put it all back on again. Mm-hmm. So it was literally a case of yo-yoing up and down, up and down between eating healthy, doing a milkshake diet, eating healthy and doing a milkshake diet. Because it, as much as I knew that I had the insulin resistance, I didn't want to be overweight. Right. So I would do things that in my mind I knew would help me to lose the weight. And around this time you were getting, you were in a relationship, weren't you getting ready to get married? I was in a relationship, um, probably a couple of years later, uh-huh. I, I was getting ready to get married, but I was in a relationship and we spoke about having children, but it wasn't something that I was like, I want to do straight away. I was I was happy just living my best life at the time, really. <laughs> yeah. um, but then, yeah, when we, we got married a few years later and I remember everyone's always like, oh, well, you're going to lose weight for your wedding. And I really, really wanted to lose weight for my wedding. And I was trying, trying, got to the point And I just thought, you know what? It's not going to happen. When I get stressed about losing weight, I actually gain weight. So I said, Kelly... Just look good on the day. Yeah. That's all. Don't try and lose weight. That's not you. Because also what's going to happen is you're going to lose weight. You're going to look fabulous in these pictures. Next year, you're going to put the weight back on and people are going to be like, oh, what happened to you? <laughs> so I thought, I don't want that. I don't want that. So I just thought, you know, I'll just look good on the day. I won't stress about losing weight and I'll be a lot more happy. And I was for a little while, but, you know, weight is something that most people, they don't want to be overweight. Yeah. So. It's funny that you said that about having to lose weight for your wedding, because I, I mean, in the introduction, I talk about how you and I both did life to life. We both lost weight. Mm-hmm. And I actually wanted to lose weight for my wedding too. And I didn't. And I was probably <laughs> almost my full heaviest that I've ever been at my actual wedding. And it was, I felt the same. Like I really wanted to lose weight, but I just couldn't get into the headspace to do it. I was just, I felt more stressed and I'd obviously had Micah at the time. So I was dealing with the stress of having, you know, preemie baby and everything else that I just couldn't do it. And I kind of defaulted into, well, he loves me. (laughs) So Mm. he's not going anywhere. He loves me. I can make up my face is all right. So I can, you know, I can do the best with, you know, with, with, with what what I've got and put less pressure. But I agree with you on the stress side that, the stress of losing the weight made me not lose the weight. And mm-hmm. I think it's kind of, I guess, exclusive to 
those of us who yo-yo in weight, who struggle with weight and always have done, because I'll speak to skinny minis who are like, just lose the weight, just start exercising, just Mm. diet. And you're like, yeah, it's not that easy. (laughs) It's not actually as simple as exercise and diet. Like for us, there's just so much more stuff going on in our heads, right? Very much so. So what did you do when you decided, like, you've, so you've gotten married now and then you've obviously, you know, you've been living your best life, married for a bit. Yeah. (laughs) You decided to have surgery, didn't you? Yeah. Well, it started off because um, I decided I couldn't live in my fat body Mm -hmm. because, first of all, before the surgery, um, we were looking into starting a family. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they say to you is, your BMI is too high, you need to lose weight, we're not going to do anything for you. So I've gone away and I'm like, well, this is my life. This is how I am. I'm like, I'm overweight and I know I am. Yeah. I try everything. Everyone I know says to me, you're the healthiest person I know. They don't understand why I'm overweight. But then that's because of the insulin resistance. But at that time, I didn't understand insulin resistance. So I decided that if the doctors weren't going to help me on the NHS, I was going to go private. So um, I went and I saw a, a nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Um, they did blood tests and they confirmed. So now I've got confirmation, not just self-diagnosis, that I do have insulin resistance because I did the fasting tests and all of those things. So what does insulin resistance actually mean? What does it do in your body? It's a bit like being diabetic. Uh So you're kind of pre-diabetic. So you've got too much insulin. The easiest way to put it is when I eat food, it doesn't burn as energy, like with everybody else, it will just store oh, on I me. See. So especially things like carbs, it literally just turn into turn into fat on my body. So I really have to be careful what I eat. And so um, I followed what the nutritionist was saying, but it just wasn't, it was working, but really slowly. Mm-hmm. And obviously now the age I am, I want to have children. And I know that with PCOS, it's something that possibly may never happen or will be very hard. How old are you? 38. So I thought to myself, well, I'm doing this, but it's not really working as fast as I need it to. Mm-hmm. So I looked into having surgery. Okay. Um, I looked into having, uh, first of all, I looked into having the band, mm. but I didn't want to do that because there's just so many things that go wrong. And just what not, kind of band? Gastric. The gastric, right. the gastric band, but it's, it was just too much for me. And then I thought, okay, I don't really want the sleeve because... I just thought, well, you're just going to eat less, but it's not as severe. So I thought about having the bypass. So when I went to see the specialist, we spoke about it, and I said I wanted to have children. But they actually said to me, I'll be better off having the sleeve. Now, a sleeve gastrectomy is where they cut out 80% of your stomach, so you can't eat as much as you would normally eat. Wow. Yeah. Um, And I think for me, that was kind of like the the last resort. I've done the dieting, I've done the exercise, I've done everything and nothing's working. Uh So I decided the fact that I'm now at the time 37 Mm -hmm. and I do want to have children and I know with PCOS it's kind of one of those things where you're going to have fertility issues. I wanted to be in the best shape possible so I decided to go ahead with it. And I think I spoke to the specialist and about a month later I had the surgery. Wow, okay. So... Just to take a a little step back then, it's a big decision to have major surgery like that, you know, to affect a core organ, Mm -hmm. right? What's your mental state at this point? What was happening like in your mind and how is it affecting your relationships and work and just everything? I think the the, the turning point and the reason why I said, you know what, I'm going to do this was because a few years previous I had called the same company Mm -hmm. and asked them about surgery completely forgot I'd called them when I called them back in 2018 and asked them about the surgery they said to me oh we've got your details on file when I put the phone down I sat back and I thought I've been dealing with this for so long Mm -hmm. these people have my details from years ago and I'm actually worse off now than I was then right do I want to live my life like this no I don't and that instant I made the decision I said I'm doing it because I can't live another five six years struggling with my weight what would you have done I, I to be honest with you I don't know I really don't know I at that point I was like I need to do something drastic 
And in my mind, I thought, if this doesn't work, I'm going to have the bypass. If that doesn't work, then I'm just supposed to be fat and that's it. Right, okay. <laughs> and, and literally, I've said that. If, if it doesn't work, this is the most drastic thing you can ever do. Yeah. If it doesn't work, my body does not want to be a slim body and it wants to be fat and that's it. Mm. But until I've exhausted every avenue, I'm going to keep trying. But I guess with because you want to have children, yeah. your main driver was... Um, not to put words in your mouth, but um, we've obviously spoken about this before, but your main driver was the fact that you wanted to give having children the best possible opportunity. Yeah. And yeah, this no, definitely. Was... That is it. If, you know, I want, because of the PCOS, I want to be in, and my age, I mm. want to be in the best possible shape. So I want to be fit. I want to be healthy. And I want to be of a BMI where, it's there's going to be no complications or you know I can just go into the fertility clinic and they're not going to say to me you need to do this you need to do that you need to do this yeah and I'm going to give having IVF or IUI the best chance possible okay so since having the surgery now how are you feeling within yourself how are you feeling mentally within yourself have now that obviously you're very slim and you know that's also you've still got to manage that and maintain it how's that process how has it all been for you I mean I do worry I worry that I'd put all the weight back on and be at square one but can you you can a lot of people don't think you can but you have to really change your life to change the way that you eat Mm -hmm. I mean for me I don't think it's as hard as it would be for a lot of other people who've had the surgery because I started to change my life anyway before that Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I worry, but I'm happy now because I know that I have had a fertility appointment. They're really happy with me. They're happy with the weight I've lost and we're moving forward. I'm having tests and things done. So I've got to where I want to be for the medical side of things Mm -hmm. and they're happy with me to move forward. They weren't happy before. And is it safe for you to carry a child and will you be able to feed the baby enough when you've not got the full stomach I don't I don't fully understand how it yeah. works so yeah I mean that's why I chose to have the sleeve and not the bypass right. because the malnutrition side of things uh-huh. all it is is that I just have to eat more so okay. I have to eat more frequently um me personally because I feel that I don't get a lot of support from the NHS doctors I probably would choose to go to a nutritionist or pay and have somebody help me to understand how to eat while I'm pregnant mm-hmm. because I obviously getting pregnant is one thing but having a healthy baby is then the next step that you have to worry about yeah. so um yeah I mean I see so many people on Instagram and Facebook that have had the surgery and they've been trying for years and within six to eight months of having the surgery they're pregnant yeah and they all have healthy babies okay I mean obviously you get people that have their complications but for the most part, they have healthy babies, so okay. it gives me hope. That's good, that's good, yeah, yeah definitely. So, talking about babies, mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you've been trying to have a baby, yeah. and if you wouldn't mind sharing what that journey's been like, because I know you've had some ups and downs with that. Yeah, it's been really difficult, really, because um, obviously I'm married to a woman, so I'm not going to get pregnant the conventional way. Right. And IVF is really expensive, yeah. really, really expensive. And the older you get, the more expensive it is, but the less your chances are. So we've kind of gone down the route of a known donor, uh-huh. um, first of all. What does that mean? That means somebody that you know. Um, literally, so literally, literally donates. somebody that you know donates okay. um, and you get pregnant that way. Um, the, the first known donor that we had, we were speaking to him for 18 months Everything was set to go ahead on the first day of the insemination. Mm -hmm. Just didn't turn up. Didn't speak to him for probably six months after that. We were trying to contact him. Didn't answer the phone. Didn't answer any text messages. And then six months later, I just sent an email apologising for not turning up. So that was really difficult. I think I've never been pregnant and had a miscarriage, Mm -hmm. but I think the potential of that turning into something yeah I felt a massive loss yeah and that was like a kick in the guts I just remember being at home and just 
staying in bed and just being really upset and my mum calling me every day and asking how I was. Yeah. And I was like, I didn't feel right to feel like that though. Because I was like, well, I wasn't even pregnant. So why do you feel like this? But there was a sense of loss. Mm-hmm. But since then, that was January 2018, we've just had so many letdowns. So each time it's just got easier and easier and easier to deal with. So then we had a guy who, um, another guy who I knew, he offered Mm -hmm. and, you know, he understood that it was going to be artificial insemination. That was something that was made clear from the beginning. Yeah. Um, But then when it came to insemination, he wanted to do it the natural way. (laughs) So I was like, well, that's not really going to (laughs) happen. So on to the next one. And what, what has been hard is that it hasn't been a case of, oh, We've spoken to somebody today and tomorrow we want the insemination. It's been a process where we've met people. Right. You know, we've spoken to them over months, got Mm. to know them. And then for one reason or another, they flaked at the last minute to the point where you might say, okay, we're going to meet up with somebody and then they don't turn up or they want something different. And it's just been a continuous letdown time after time after time to the point where I'm now... I go into it thinking you're going to let me down, right. which is really bad. I, I mean, I feel that people say about the energy that you put into it yeah, and I don't want to have that energy, but yeah. because we've had so many letdowns in my mind, I don't want to put my heart into it for someone to let me down. So at this point I'm saving to buy sperm. Right. Yeah. Like I'm obviously I've got these things going on in the background, but yeah. in my mind I'm like, okay, I'm going to go to a sperm bank because I can't rely on people for my happiness yeah I mean obviously it's a big decision for you and it's a big decision for the donor Mm -hmm. uh, if you're doing it the sort of known donor way yeah and I know you're a compassionate person you can understand where they're coming Mm -hmm. from when they decide last minute that they can't do it obviously they're not thinking about you and your feelings and that feeling of loss that you're talking about I think it's totally acceptable and very real you know it's a process so you're going to feel all those feelings and we can understand where they're coming from but obviously it's it's gonna hurt you and I mean how does that within your relationship how have you been able to get through and go to either the next donor or to this decision now to save up Mm -hmm. I think it's it's actually really hard for my partner right because she feels like she can't protect me. And because she's 31, she knows that she's got a bit more time than me. Yeah. So when these things happen, in her mind, she knows, okay, well, I've got time. I can go through IVF or I can find somebody or, you know, she's got that time. But for me, she knows that the clock is ticking. And with every letdown, it's just like another little bit of my heart being broken. And yeah. she can't protect my heart. And in your relationship, it's you who wants to carry. Is that right? At this time, yeah. At this point, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I want to be the one to carry, um, not only because of my age, but because just life. Personally wanting to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I want to do that. Um, so we have had the conversation about carrying her eggs and things like that, but I want I, I want to try myself. You want to have a go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If it doesn't work, then it wasn't meant to be, and then we'll go down that route. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, I just try first and have my own DNA. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you, of course. And... This, I mean, the whole journey, the weight loss, the weight gain, the, the PCOS, the insulin resistance, all the the things that you've been going through and then obviously being through the, the sperm donation process too. I mean, that's a lot of stuff, right, that mm-hmm. you've had going on in your life. And you've got a house, you've got a mortgage, you've still got to work, you've still got family, you've still got friends, you've still got a partner to be with, you've still got stuff going on. How have you managed it mentally like I know we joked about it downstairs just now when we said that you know you were like oh I'm mentally unstable and I was like mm, well you're not but are you mm. are you like what 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 does that actually mean what are you saying like how are you essentially waking up every morning and still doing it because it's you know it's been years right mm-hmm. and it's such a gosh and it's all emotional it has been years and I think at the beginning like when I was younger there was a lot of things that I did to kind of make myself feel better but you know as you get older you start to realize that that's not really the way that you need to live your life right um and then also finding out more about having PCOS kind Mm -hmm. of helped me in not 
and fe- not feeling like I'm a failure mm-hmm. because it's not my fault. And I think in my mind, I sometimes forget that. Did you have counselling? I've had counselling, but not for, well, I guess, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because I guess it all kind of comes together. So, yeah, I've had I've had counselling on and off throughout the years. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess for me, I just have to always remember that it's not my fault because I think a lot of the issues that I've had in general have been weight related, mm-hmm. um, you know, not feeling good enough, all that kind of, those kind of things. They have been related to my weight. And so for a period of time, I'll be sad about it. But then I, I'd snap out of it and say, look, Kelly, this is not your fault. You have a condition. You're not greedy. You're not just not doing things you're supposed to. You're doing everything right. It's just that this condition is slowing you down. So you can't beat yourself up about it. So I always go back to that point and just try and remember that continuously, that it's not your fault and you're doing your best. And that's all you can do is your best. There are times when, you know, having the baby, that gets me down. That's Mm. more so what gets me down than um, having PCOS is the fact that I'm getting older. I don't know, you know, if I'm going to be able to go through and and get pregnant and things like that. But then I, I don't know what it is. I think I just push it back to the back of my head and I don't deal with it, which I know is really bad. But I sometimes I feel like if I deal with it, if I think about it too much, I will have a breakdown. I won't go to work. I will stay in bed and life will not be a good place for me right. to live. So it's almost like you're compartmentalising the things that you're going through. You, you're you're on the journey. You know you're on the journey and every day you are working towards that journey. And I guess yeah. for now when you've decided that you're going to pay for it, it's your you need to work to save the money mm-hmm. in order to take it. So it's sort of like you've you've actually almost broken it down into the smallest chunks that you can, which is the right now I need to work in order to pay for it. Yeah. Once I've got the money, then I will think about the next step and then the next step and mm-hmm. I guess for me, from a coaching perspective, I would, that's sort of how I would work with the client to bring it down to its smallest chunk because it's so overwhelming and can cause so much negativity and actually have the negative effect on having a baby if you're so consumed with the thought of the actual process because it is so much and so much of it is out of your hands, mm, right? Definitely. Like it's, you, you only have so much control of this whole process that it's a lot better excuse me for your mental health to actually break it down to these smallest chunks and I know we've talked about it a little bit where we've had sort of like sly coaching on the side (laughs) as friends and you know you you talked about it as well but mindset being very key on how you approach this whole scenario is is really important like if you think in terms of oh, you're going to let me down again, or, oh, it's not going to happen, or I'm definitely going to have um, difficulties in my pregnancy because that's what happens when you have PCOS. You're almost creating the inevitable. Mm -hmm. And if you, it's hard to not think like that. Don't get me wrong, I understand. It's very hard not to think like that. But if you can think in terms of, I need to now do this and just focus on it from a smaller perspective rather than, I want this baby. Yes, you want the baby. That's a big, big goal. Mm -hmm. But for now, you need to create that smaller goal, which is I need the money for the baby. And I can do that. I have control. I can do that. I can. That's something that is tangible. And you can stay positive towards that. That actually creates more of that positive thinking and the right mindset towards having that baby. And hopefully that working out to being a positive outcome rather than obviously a negative one. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So how do you feel now, now that you're in that state of saving the money and that's what you're going to do? Are you feeling brighter or are you having down days? What about being around children? Does that affect you? Being around children, being around older children Uh is okay. But what I have found is that over the last couple of years, when friends have been pregnant, it's been a bit hard for me. And then having a baby, it's been a bit hard. I do have one friend that I probably haven't seen in probably about nine months Mm -hmm. because I feel that she was really, I think when you're pregnant, there's a part of me that feels like, yes, you should be celebrating and you should be really happy. But as a close friend of mine, you also know my issues. Mm -hmm. So I think 
I would hope that you would be a little bit more mindful of that. Yeah. <laughs> and she wasn't. And yeah. it was really difficult. And I think another one of her friends was going through the same thing as me. Mm -hmm. She's been mad for a few years, trying to get pregnant, isn't able to. And I just put it out there because they had a big argument and falling out. And I put it out there and I said, do you think this could be why she's not talking to you? Mm, it could. And so she said to me, it could be. It could be. But, you know, and then she just kind of dismissed it. Yeah. And I just thought, mm, you've got to be human about it. Like, you now have this baby. Yeah. She's still trying you know, even if you pick up the phone and you speak to her, you know, and she says whatever and she's mean. Mm. OK, she's mean, but, you know, you've spoken to her and, you know, when you put down the phone, you've still got that baby. She doesn't have that. And I kind of could see myself in her as well. And I just thought you're really not compassionate at all. Yeah. And it just is hard to be around her because she's very overbearing with this child of hers which is fine you know mm. she's happy she's got the baby that she's always wanted because there was a point in time where we were both oh my gosh we're getting older we need to do this and obviously it's happened for her it hasn't happened for me and I'm happy for her I just don't like the way that it's kind of for me I feel like it's rubbed in my face it's, right. that's not what she's doing but that's how I feel so mm -hmm. I kind of keep my distance because I don't want that negativity around her and her child yeah it's an interesting thing that you bring up actually because it is the self-awareness around babies and conceiving it's a really difficult thing to manage because mm. I mean I know being single for so long and not having babies and wanting babies and being around babies or being around marriage I was like I want that I want that and I found it really hard and I wouldn't go to certain weddings and I wouldn't go to baby showers because it was just too traumatizing almost mm. for me because it was like it's not me and it's not their fault you know they're, they're just doing them they're just living mm -hmm. their life but it, it was it was too much for me and so I just avoided those sorts of things and then when I had when I got pregnant we were lucky to get pregnant on we, we weren't trying it it was an accident and but we had a difficult pregnancy and we had a difficult birth and mm -hmm. I didn't have a baby bump and get a baby shower I didn't go to antenatal classes I don't have that those antenatal friends and stuff so I have a a different side of you know where you mm -hmm. are right now and so when people are talking I'm like I don't have any antenatal friends I don't have any like baby friends I've just got my friends who I had before yeah. <laughs> you know who might have had some babies around the same time and mm -hmm. I, I've kind of I mean I say lucky and in inverted commas but one of my close friends actually had a premature baby like mine mm -hmm. and so her and I we were obviously we were already close but it's brought us closer in a in a way that I won't have with anyone else because of the similarity of our journey. But it hurts me when I hear people talk about their pregnancies and their baby bumps and they get, they have baby showers. And I have the same fear because my consultant told me that the chances of this happening again is high. Mm -hmm. So I'm in this state of, well, we'd like another baby, but I don't want to go through all of that again because, you know, I'm in year four and mm. I still cry. You know, Micah's birthday's coming up next week and I'm an emotional wreck. My husband is too. We just are, we'd like, we kind of, I was talking to a friend about it, but we cry the tears that we couldn't cry when he was born. Mm. We cry them now. We cry them every December because we remember the days leading up to his birth and then the actual day. And I always cry on his birthday. I'm a complete and utter mess. But I find that self-awareness in general with women, we're aware that people have trouble conceiving and, and go through the fertility treatments and everything and the disappointments and the ups and downs and that roller coaster. But when it actually comes down to it, to an individual place we, we don't seem to have the sensitivity I guess for that self-awareness and I think it's something that we should all definitely work on because mm -hmm. I feel really conscious about talking about my son so I try not to talk about him too much because I don't want to be that person who upsets someone else and obviously yeah. self-awareness is a big thing with with my personal work and whenever a friend who doesn't have kids who I know wants kids asks me how Micah is just you know like that chit chat how you doing how's Micah how's Dwayne I'll generally keep it light he's good he's doing he's doing really well and sort of leave it there I don't give more and I know that they want more that like you're expecting more from me but 
I don't feel it right unless you ask me a specific question because it could hurt you mm -hmm. at some point mm -hmm. that I was banging on about. <laughs> Michael, and I don't want to be the one who, who does that. It is it is really difficult, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, for me, Michael's four, so... <laughs> <I'm fine. laughs> You're okay. Tell me whatever you want about him, but it's, it's the baby stage. Like, I know. I had another friend who had a baby and it took me ages to go and see her. Yeah. Because I had to just kind of, like, build up that courage. And especially the one thing that really annoys me is when people say to me, are you sure you want to do this? Yes, yes, I am. Yeah, I'm very sure that I want to have this child because a lot of people that say that to me now, they didn't plan to have their child. Oh, you mean so if they've had a baby and obviously oh, having sorry. a baby is tough yeah. work, then, yeah. then like, they're saying, oh. They, 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 when their child is doing something, like getting into something, pulling things down, and they're like, oh, pulling their hair out. I'm like, are you sure you want to do this? And I really want to say to them, your child was an accident. I'm planning mine. But obviously you can't say that. But in my head, I'm like, yes, I do. I do. I had a conversation with somebody recently and I said, you know, I'm really sad. Like within, I'm sad. And she said to me, why are you sad? You drive a nice car, you have a, you have a good job and you live in a really nice place. Like, why are you sad? And I said, these are all materialistic things. And her yeah. two kids were in the back. And I said, if you were to lose everything, you still have these two. I don't have that. Mm. And that's the one thing right now that would make me happy in life is if I had a child. So you looking at my life just because I have all these things, yeah. that doesn't mean that I'm a happy person. Yeah, And that kind of just summed it up for me. Like people look at you from the outside and they really don't understand what you're going through. Mm. It's tough. Mm. It really is. It breaks my heart that anyone I know goes through this. It just... It really does. Because there's, uh, there's nothing you can do apart from support no, that person, no, right? It it's so tough. So I think we'll leave it there. I feel like you've shared a lot. And I'm so grateful that you have. And both of us have managed not to cry mm -hmm. during the process. So I think that's yes. a big result Very in big itself. Result. <laughs> but before you go, is there anything, any words of wisdom, I guess, from the process I know you're still in your journey mm -hmm. and I would love to be able to talk to you a little further down into the journey and, and see how things are going obviously mm -hmm. but is there anything that you could share with the listeners that if anyone else is going through this journey that you know like if I knew them or any words of wisdom any little nuggets for me I would just say understand your body mm -hmm. and always look into things understand why things are happening or if they're not happening and just have a positive outlook yeah positive mental attitude is what they say I think <laughs> and I think the way sometimes that I deal with it is um, my mind goes to a place where I think the world is so horrible do I actually want to bring another human into it or am I supposed to just look after one that's here already mm -hmm. and give them a better life than the one that they may possibly have I mean, we could now add on and make this a longer podcast, but then that would be sort of like the next step in that journey. So you tried to have a baby naturally, and if that didn't work, the whole adoption process or... Yeah. And that would be something to consider. I guess I know a few people myself who've gone through the facility treatments and unfortunately it hasn't worked, so now they're going through the adoption process, but they're sort of... They're okay with it because it's all part of the journey. The, the want is to have the child yeah and however that child is supposed to be with them is however it's supposed to be i guess that takes a lot of faith mm -hmm. kelly i just want to say thank you again for doing this i really appreciate it and i wish you all the very best for this journey thank you and you're welcome i just hope that it helps and even, even if it's just one person yeah i hope it does too thank you so much again for listening today if you enjoyed this episode, then please subscribe to the Self Care 101 podcast. For more tips and tricks, head over to my website, franklycoaching.com, or for daily inspiration, you can follow me on the socials at franklycoaching. Talk to you soon.